Today on the Mr. Maple Show, we interview the grumpy gardener, Steve Bender. Today, the grumpy gardener will be discussing why Japanese maples are his favorite plant, how the grumpy gardener got into gardening, gardening tips, and what makes him a grumpy gardener. Guys, do we tick off the Grumpy Gardener even more? You're going to have to stick around to find out. We're starting out with an amazing first interview here on the Mr. Maple Podcast. You can find us on all major platforms to subscribe on Spotify, Pandora, uh, any of your major podcast platforms. Go ahead and find us there. And we are airing these episodes on YouTube on our Mr. Maple Show every Sunday at 8 p.m. So definitely subscribe to the Mr. Maple Show there. I think you're going to want to stick around for this one. We're starting out the interviews with an amazing talent here. We've got Steve Bender, a.k.a. the Grumpy Gardener. I don't think you guys are going to want to miss this one. He's one of the top guys at Southern Living Magazine. I think this was probably one of my favorite interviews I think we could do, but for gardening, this Mm -hmm. was an amazing one. I know so many people follow his Grumpy Gardener articles (laughs) through Southern Living Magazine, and it's so awesome to get in there. And hear him talk about Japanese maples. Hey, it's not only that. Steve has said in so many different interviews, whether he's doing an interview, uh, his favorite plant is a Japanese maple. So when it comes to getting a gardening celebrity on our show to talk about Japanese maples, we couldn't help but think about Steve Bender, a.k.a. the Grumpy Gardener. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channels, subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform, and share this with your gardening friends. Word of mouth really helps us spread We'd really appreciate it. And make sure you shop on MrMaple.com. Steve Bender is an award-winning author, editor, columnist, and speaker with 38 years of experience as garden editor, senior writer, and editor-at-large for the Southern Living Magazine. Known as the Grumpy Gardener, he shares his horticultural wisdom with Southerners and gardener enthusiasts across the country. Hey, that was kind of generic. I think I can even do better. So today we have Steve Bender, King of Grumpy, First of his name, defender of garden knowledge and slayer of bad questions. He loves cats and beer from PBR to fine microbrews, and he is gardening stand-up comedian. So please uh, join us in welcoming Steve Bender to the show. Oh, geez. Thanks, man. Um, I couldn't have said it better myself. Awesome, awesome. Hey, we're, we're super honored to have you here. Uh, you know, we're, we're big fans. So uh, I actually have reached my pinnacle of coolness now. My <laughs> family members, and they, they don't know a single plant I grow, but my mother-in-law and several other family members are like, Steve Bender, I know exactly who that is. So now I'm cool <laughs> since I've interviewed you. Well, I'm glad I could bestow that to status on you. You deserve it. My crowning achievement now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. hey, hey, Steve, I, I know that one of your favorite plants that we've ran across. I mean, I know because you've gotten trees from us in the past, some of your videos, you talk about how Japanese maples are your favorite plant. Uh, You know, what makes, I I know you've talked about this before, but for our listeners, for you, what makes Japanese maple one of your favorite plants? Well, I think it's because um, just the genetic variability in the plant. I mean, there's so many different kinds. Yeah. Um, so many different foliage colors, so many different growth habits, rate of growth, um, spring color, summer color, fall color. Um, and you can grow them in containers, grow them out in the yard. Uh, and then also, I think I get a lot of questions from people who plant things, uh, trees out in the yard and never check the mature size. <laughs> and, um, uh, so, you know, you'll see uh, somebody plant, um, you know, um, maybe a, a ginkgo or a silver maple like in root in front of their house or even the worst, which is a uh, river perch. And it just eats up the whole house and people don't have a whole lot of space. So what is something that size is um, small to moderate, grows at a controlled rate so you don't have to prune it all the time? And won't eat up your youth. And first thing that comes to mind, Japanese maple. Right. I know Matt and I see that too, and we're like, 
we run across that all the time with the maturity size thing. I mean, it's almost like a marketing term a lot of people use. At maturity. At maturity. And with Japanese maples that live for so long, it's crazy because you can't say that there's a complete mature size. You just have to set a time frame. I know Matt and I try to say like 10 or 15 years so people get an understanding. We try to give the most honest answer we can. Um, I think like Tim was saying, I think mature at maturity can be a catch all term that can be disingenuous. Like I kind of laugh when I see some that say at maturity, this could be three to 15 feet. I'm like, well, dang, that's a pretty wide range there. Right. Well, I just think that people, uh, they really have to, um, do a little research before they plant something close to the house, especially a tree, uh, and, and really try and find, uh, a tree that, once they plant, they'll be happy with it for the next 15 to 20 years if they stay there. And it's not going to block the window. It's not going to block the walk. It's not going to, yeah. you know, block the porch. Oh, we completely agree. That's one of the reasons we try to, we try to give 15 year periods. And, you know, some people love that. Some people hate that. Some people are like, that's a cop out to tell you a 15 year period. But we try to give it to be the most honest answer so that you can kind of plan ahead. Yeah. That's what I think. So, we, you've talked about what makes Japanese maples, why you think they're awesome. I mean, and what was there a breakthrough moment that you said, hey, Japanese maples are this amazing plant? Or is it just something that over time that you realized it became one of your favorite plants? Well, I grew up with a Japanese maple in the yard, um, and it was the old blood good. And um, for a while there, I mean, blood good was kind of a standard if you wanted to have a red Japanese maple. That's the one that they had in nurseries, and, you know, it held its color all through the summer and uh, turned a really nice color in the fall and, you know, grew a, a decent size, but not, you know, terribly big and everything like that. And I just thought that they were really pretty trees. And then the breeders came along and started doing all this fantastic work in the last 20 years and found all these, these great plants, you know, variegated ones and and ones that are yellow in the summer and all these weeping forms and all these little dwarfs that you can grow in containers. And it just kind of blows your mind um, how the variety that's out there, it's like a, so you can choose, you ought to be able to find a Japanese maple that's going to do exactly what you want to do no matter what your situation is. And I like the fact that Japanese maples, it's not just a one-season thing. Uh, a lot of Japanese maples, actually, in my opinion, are as pretty or prettier in the springtime with the mm-hmm. spring foliage as they are with, in the fall. So it uh, it's, uh, gives you more uh, bang for your buck. Oh, couldn't agree more. Uh, I love talking to Grumpy Gardener about something he loves. We're hoping by the end of this podcast, you can be only the slightly annoyed gardener. (laughs) Keep talking about (laughs) things you love here. Uh, So I've got another question for you. And I know you did the book, Pass Along Plants. Uh, You know, Japanese maples, in a way, were passed along to us. Because that lifespan, because a grafted Japanese maple can live to be over 100 years old, or even some seedlings, our grandmother passed along her love of gardening with us because I have trees in my garden right now that are trees she planted in the 1950s. So uh, what do you think about wow. Japanese maples kind of as like a legacy plant? I know they might not be a propagated plant by a lot of people, but they are something you kind of get sometimes uh, by default because they outlive us all. I mean, it's a plant that, that will be there for the next generation. Well, there's a, I mean, there's an easy way to pass along a Japanese maple. One would be get one of the dwarfs and grow it in a container. Yeah. I have a, um, I have a, um, uh, a crimson queen that's out in my front yard, and um, it started off as a Mother's Day uh, present to my wife about 25 years ago. I want to say about the first 15 years of its life, it, it was in a container back on the deck, um, and it, it grew just fine back there. But then a tree died in our front yard, and we decided to move it out since it's such a pretty tree, and it's doing great out there. So. You, you know, I, I look at your website. I look at these guys <laughs> collect all these plants. You know, and they got the whole they got the whole driveway covered with all these plants. You know, <laughs> and they, I mean, I up thirty eight different kinds now. You know, we, and, we, we uh, do play into that collector mentality a little bit here. Yeah, I wonder how these guys ever leave home. 
I mean, <laughs> I mean, I wonder does each one of their trees have its own like cell number so they can they can check it or does it have its own sensor so they can get on their phone and check if it needs water or something. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, you know, it, it does. Uh, uh, it is something that causes a certain bit of fanaticism. <laughs> the other thing is, um, I had a friend of mine I worked with, and he had a he had a, uh, a Japanese maple. It was one of these slower growing kinds. I'm not sure if it was a, um, if it was one of the weeping kinds or not. But he just started growing the seeds, and um, it's amazing how the, when he when the seeds came up. Um, there was lots of different leaf forms, and there was lots of, some of them grew faster than others, and had different kind of growth habits. So, I mean, you can grow Japanese oh, maples yeah. and seedlings, and that's how we get basically a whole lot of the different varieties we have. Um, people sowing seeds and seeing what they what comes up and what they like. Oh, for sure. That's kind of how we got going. And uh, maybe we've got another TV show there. We can have next on the horticultural hoarders. We can. <laughs> Do you have over yeah. 500 of one genus? Yeah, our dad actually collected seedling Japanese maples and took them to the local flea market. And actually, you know, some of those plants, one of those plants actually is one of our introductions from our Area 51 collection from ones that he had grown in his yard for years and years and years. And the people can definitely do that. That's how we got our passion and our love for gardening is through our dad collecting those seeds. I know that uh, you got your love for gardening, from what I understand, from working with your dad as well. Um, oh, yeah. It, it like h- How did that moment come to fruition when you realized that this is something your dad has sort of instilled in you, but it's something you want to do for a living? Well, we, you know, my father, when we, when we were growing up, he was always a big gardener. Um, and he had, that was a hobby that he had. Um, and so I was always watching him, you know, plant things out in the yard. I wasn't too much into gardening until I became my later teen years. And um, they uh, built a new church close to us that we went to and had a uh, blank plate, uh, just a huge, big, you know, lawn area with nothing planted in it. So, um, they nominated us to uh, plant some trees over there. So we started, um, just, we would get a lot of native trees out of the woods, but we also had some Japanese maples. So we would put those over there too. And they were always so pretty. So I got really interested in plants that way. And I learned all the botanical names. So by the time, I finally reached a point where I was studying horticulture. I already knew all the botanical names of everything. And, um, it just became a, just became a prime hobby of mine. And, uh, I've still got a lot of, uh, some plants that I've brought back from the house. I've gotten out around my house now. Too. So, um, it's a nice way, uh, to, uh, kind of, uh, link generations together when you can say you've got something that you've got from your, you know, your, your father, your mother, your grandfather, grandfather, something like that. Oh yeah, that's super cool. I think that's one of the things I love most about gardening is kind of that that legacy. Now I've got another. Hey, hot... I got a question for you. Sure, sure. I got a question for you. Since you said I could ask you this question, um, do you know uh, notice uh, that when you uh, you get uh, emails or letters or whatever from your customers that a lot of the big collectors and the hoarders uh, turn out to be men? I would say it is equal part. Uh, it's interesting. Oh, really? I would say there's a, we have a lot, uh, you know, we, we jokingly get people that call in to our office and they say, Hey, can you send us out on a Wednesday so that my husband's not home so that uh, <laughs> I won't get in trouble for this. And we have a lot of collectors. I would say there's definitely something about the way doctors learn and a lot of doctors oh, are collectors because exactly they kind of get right. into that clinical line of thinking and they really yeah. love that nomenclature and the, you know, that, that, is so true. that kind of the you know, name when, side when of things. Was, when I was, uh, when I was working full time and, and traveling around the South scouting gardens, um, every time I, I could, we would be shown some new place. Uh, and I'd take one look at it. I go, <laughs> this is a surgeon's garden. <laughs> because they would have one of 
everything. And the one that they had had to be weird. Yeah. So it's something it's to do like, with that training, right? It's it's the it's, it's the way the mind works. It's uh, they're drawn yeah, they, to that they, nomenclature as well. It, it's like uh, there's a, a, a probably a lot of crossover between Japanese maple guys and dwarf conifer guys. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they want they look at it and go, oh, I gotta have that. One. I gotta <laughs> have that one. So I go around and I would say, if I if I see more than twenty five dwarf conifer, <laughs> I know this guy. Is, uh, you know, he's probably a brain surgeon or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Tim and I are kind of naturally hoarders by nature. Yeah, yeah. Matt and I, Matt and I would collect everything growing up, and it was crazy because we'd be out selling plants at the flea market with our dad. We'd sell little Johnny jump ups, and then Matt would take that money that we found and we'd go collect the other things at the flea market. And Matt would push me forward because I was the younger brother. And I would, I'd be like five, you know, four or five years old. And I'd walk up and say, how much is this? And that's how we got the most bang for our buck was Matt would put me out there in the front to the old ladies who were selling stuff that we wanted. So we've tried to turn that, that crazy part of our brain that makes us collectors and hoarders into a business, I guess. And that's how we've come about doing it this way. I shouldn't make too much fun of the people who collect more conifers and and stuff like that. Cause I collect, um, antique glass insulators <laughs> that's a real specific niche we'll, we'll next on the yeah. antique glass <laughs> podcast <laughs> I, I thought we were niche yeah. <laughs> now steve yeah I, th- I had to get i had to get on medication after that one now steve <laughs> we talked about doctors being big collectors you know i think part of it too is it's their escape i mean gardening is their escape where they can get out into the gardening and they can get out there and relax. And their profession is so strongly stressful stressful that it allows them to escape from that too. And I think that's a big part of it. This gives them something yeah. relaxing and an escape mechanism to get out into the garden and really enjoy something that's out in nature and, and very relaxing. Yeah, and I think the other thing is if you're a surgeon, you're, lo- you're used to looking at the very fine detail of plants. Mm-hmm. I mean, of what you're doing. And I think that when they get those plants, they're noticing all the very fine details the average person would. Um, and that, that uh, is, is a draw. I mean, like, for instance, I have in my front yard, I have a very old Asakazuki, mm-hmm. which, um, uh, you know, is... Uh, came for its fall color, but in springtime, it, it uh, shoots out these mint green leaves, and then it has these beautiful sprays of red flowers, deep red flowers mm-hmm. against the leaves. The ordinary person probably <laughs> wouldn't get close enough to see that, but I would, and I have a phone that takes pictures. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Uh, so I've got a goofy question for you here. Ten years, okay. you have to make a decision. No gardening or no beer? What's your choice? Uh, let me see. I've got 10 years. Um, well, I have pictures of my garden, so I can look <laughs> at them while I'm drinking beer. <laughs> Man solves everything. He's got the answers. <laughs> so, so, so back to Japanese maples. You've got Osakazuki. You've got some other plants in your garden. I know you've got fire glow and some other different plants. What's oh, your, yeah. and you've went to so many different gardens across the South. What's your favorite Japanese maple for the South? Oh gosh. You see, when people say the <laughs> one favorite for anything, it kind of drives you nuts because, um, it's like saying, okay, who's your favorite kid? Right. I'm, you know, I'm lucky because I only have one. So I have to be the favorite, you know, <laughs> it never comes home anymore. Um, boy, that's a really tough one. For me, I mean, the ones that I recommend, um, I, uh, I try and pick out something that's going to have, going to be good for just about so many different situations. Mm -hmm. So if I was to pick out, um, an upright Japanese maple and I wanted it to be red in the summer, and hold its color and all that stuff. Uh, the top choices I always tell people 
the example of one and car club. Yeah. Um, because they're so dependable. And uh, they give you the plan that you expect. They don't go too big, but also they don't leap out too early in the springtime because there are some Japanese maples, especially where I live, that they are, they're leaving out in February. Yeah. And the problem with that is uh, that if we get a freeze, it kills off all the foliage. Like, I love Tetsu. I love the way that tree looks in the springtime with all that gold and orange and the leaves and everything. But it really leaves out early. So, I don't know. I think that uh, uh, the, if you just look at the popular uh, Japanese maple, it used to be, um, you know, the weeping ones um, used to be like, you know, uh, Prince and Queen's always mm-hmm. going to stand it. But now they kind of, you can go around to the garden center and it seems like everybody's got the Bukiyama, right. the waterfall. Uh, those are great. I love my one of my absolute favorites. If you love something cheap, I love that dwarf, uh, Makawa Yatsubusha. Oh yeah, uh, I, that is such a neat little plant. It's got such a great little compact form, layered form, and the whole color um, is just spectacular. The problem that I have with it is it grows so slow <laughs> that I think. By the time it's four feet tall, I'm going to be six feet under. <laughs> That's a good quote right there. I think one of the funny things about maples are we do think about our own mortality with them because we give people sizes and years sometimes, and they're like, in 20 years. <laughs> okay. uh, so with your experience with Southern Living, you know some amazing gardens. Uh, do you have a favorite garden around the South? I know you talk about Longwood a lot, and that's always been one of the ones you mentioned a good bit. But uh, what are some of oh, your favorite yeah. gardens around the South? Well, I think that we I think they, if we just wow, the um Longwood would be one. Um, I would say the gardens of uh Winterton up in Delaware or another. I'd say um Biltmore as a as a great gardens as well to go to. Oh gosh, I'm thinking you know, my mind races when you ask me. Right, I know, <laughs> I know. You've got like, you've got so I much throughout the years. I've been to so many of these these things. Uh, uh, so many different cities have great botanical gardens inside them. Um, I mean, boy, my mind races all the places. I just think of Huntington Gardens out in California, and I think of Fort Shark Gardens in uh, British Columbia. And um, well, that one's on my list. I've never been there. I'm living out, I'm leaving out so many really, um, really great gardens that are in Florida and Louisiana. Um, we've got some real pretty ones here in Alabama, too. Uh, Huntsville Botanical Gardens has done a really great job up there. Um, and let me see, uh, I think, oh, um, places like um, up in uh, Kentucky, um, uh, it's the Arboretum up there. Um, oh, see, this is what you do. Oh, Are you talking about Bernheim Arboretum in Louisville? Bernheim. Bernheim. Yeah. I love Bernheim Ar- Arboretum up there. If you love trees, uh, and you love to see trees in, in uh, their kind of mature form where they're not crowded by any other trees, um, and so they grow into this, this, the perfect ideal form that they naturally would, that's where I would go. Nice. Bernheim Arboretum in the fall is just absolutely spectacular. Uh, I'll get in one uh, a question here from a, um, a mail-in question. Uh, this was from a viewer in Charlotte, North Carolina, who wanted to be referred to as just Mr. J. And he wanted to know what your opinion on garden gnomes is. <laughs> I know who you're talking about. <laughs> See, Mr. J. Um, and I know what his his uh, opinion is I can't repeat the quote that he gave me about <laughs> them but he hates them for some reason uh, I just think they're just kind of funny uh, to put out there you know I like I went off to visit him um, and of course I had to bring a home uh, for his new house he was building up there I had to bring a house for him again so I gave him a gnome um, I don't know <laughs> nice. I, I mean I mean, I mean, 
yeah, you can say, you know, they're really, really tacky and everything like that. <laughs> but sometimes you just want to put something in a garden just to cause people to laugh. Or something. Of course. So I don't look down on people who do stuff like that. I mean, I have a, I have two bottle trees in my garden with um, absolutely authentic antique cobalt blue uh, milk of magnesia bottle. Um, I have like, I, I'll just put stuff out there. I um, Sometimes when I get bored in the wintertime, I look in my woods out there and I'll go and I'll spray paint uh, the trunk of a tree blue <laughs> just so I have some color <laughs> in winter, nice. you know, or purple. So, I mean, it's just kind of a, it's just kind of like a, we had to throw that, that one out there. Smile. Jay's I mean, going to be on yeah. an upcoming podcast, so uh, we actually talked to him this week. <laughs> We're going to be speaking to his garden club and uh, had to ask him some questions to bug you about. I, I think you're right, though. Gardening is just supposed to be fun. I mean, that's what gardening is about, is going out there and enjoying the garden. And so if if gnomes are the way you enjoy gardening, why not, right? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got my... Actually, you do need a kick out of this. Um, if you go on to my grumpy gardener Facebook page and look at my um, big Danner photo. It says area 51. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. And uh, yeah. And, and so you can see why uh, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy back there, but really gardening is about all about having fun. Um, it's not about impressing your neighbors. Um, it's not about getting your garden. Southern living. Um, it's, mainly about what makes you happy and what takes the stress out of your life. And for a lot of people, uh, Jay would agree with this, uh, and your listeners are going to wonder, who's this Jay guy? Well, <laughs> you'll find out. Um, but I would definitely say, when you're out there gardening, you're digging, and you're moving plants around, you're not thinking about all the terrible stuff that's happening all you know, all over the world. Right. You're thinking uh, just about how beautiful this plant is and how it's going to look with that plant. And kind of like the fun and the planning of it and, you know, taking care of it. And I, I like going out and pruning things. Um, so that, to me, is like the main part of gardening. It's not to necessarily impress others, although it's always nice <laughs> when you have a neighbor stop and say, wow, I really love that. Like, I have a Japanese persimmon tree. I'm not sure if they're hardy up in your area. Yeah. But the uh, persimmons are giant, and they look like big orange tomatoes in the tree. Oh, yeah. And and the leaves turn bright red in the fall. And all of my neighbors, when they come down, they never fail to ask, what's that tree? And hey. so I'll give them a Japanese persimmon because they've never had one. Oh, yeah, they're amazing. They're, they're delicious, too. They're delicious, and you can eat the whole thing. There's no core. So, you know, I, I always enjoy when people ask questions. You know, a gardener never get mad if they see somebody coming and looking at a plant, you know. Say, so I notice you guys, uh, you sell lots of other things uh, besides the maple. Yeah, yeah, we, we do some uh, some azaleas, some native azaleas. We do some uh, conifers. We do some coralopsis, uh, some cayenneanthus. I mean, again, we, again we, we're plant hoarders extraordinaire. So we find an area we like, and then we have to have everything that's ever been named in that category. First, you look for the yeah. dwarf, then the variegated, then the weeper, and then you start finding columnar. the variations, the columnar, and then everything in between. Yeah, you got a lot of ginkgos. Oh yeah, yeah, right we there. love ginkgos. <laughs> yeah, really popular I, plant I, for us. Yeah, yeah. I had um, my first. Experience with the ginkgo. We had a giant ginkgo when I was in campus, when I was in college on campus. Uh, and I loved the tree. It looked kind of free of spirit, and it turned a beautiful color in the fall. The only problem was it was a female ginkgo. Right. <laughs> and uh, I got to love it so much. This is before I actually got into the horticultural business. And so I wanted to grow a ginkgo because I thought it was so great. So I went out there one fall. And it had dropped all this fruit on the ground. I go, wow, maybe I can grow one from seed. So I grabbed like two or three of these things. Right. And I put it in the top drawer of my desk in my room. Oh. And then over the, about the next 10 days, my room said, <laughs> what is that? No, oh what is that gosh. coming from? What is it? And I ripped open the, you know, and then, uh, the, the uh, stench came out. Like, oh I was more unconscious. It was, it was. 
a biblical experience. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, we've <laughs> actually offered some specific cultivars that are distinctly a female ginkgo here at our nursery. And I always <clears> joke <throat> that they're great if you want to roast them like a chestnut, like in some delicacies yeah. in some Asian countries. Or if you have an arch nemesis who's into gardening and you really want to do something evil to him. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's, here's a funny story about kinkos. I have a friend of mine. He's a he's a, a, a garden designer up in Kentucky, and he moved into a house that has the biggest ginkgo in Kentucky. It's huge. Well, everything was fine because it was a male <laughs> ginkgo, and then one year, all of a sudden, it sprouted a female branch. Ooh. And it started fruiting on that branch. And I figure it's because as male ginkgo, there was no other females around. He just got real frustrated. <laughs> right. <laughs> they have been around, uh, you know, prehistorically. So it's kind of a Jurassic yeah. Park nature finds a way sometimes. They, they've that's found a way exactly to stick around this whole time, right? Say. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. If nature finds a way, you know, you say, okay, well, there can be no more of this because there's only – there's only a male here and there's only a female, but nature finds a way. So I've got something that really grinds my gears. It makes me grumpy. I want to ask you about, I know you've been credited for coining the term crepe murder. And, uh-huh. uh, what do you think about people poodling Japanese maples? So we're going to coin this term maple massacres. And this is when people uh-huh. just take like the hedge pruners to their Japanese maples and create these odd hedge Japanese maple shapes. That is absolutely loathsome. I used to do, uh, 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 when I would go talk to garden cl- clubs, I would have a, a presentation and I would show all the horrible mistakes that gardeners <laughs> made. And somebody in our neighborhood had um, had a, uh, like, I think it was a crimson queen maple and had pruned it into a globe. Yeah. And so I would just I would just show the picture of it, and I would say I'll give like ten dollars to anybody who can tell me what tree this is. <laughs> and I still ha- I still had the ten dollars because it's like. And then when I told them it was a crimson queen Japanese maple, this collective groan. Oh you no! Know? I mean, uh, I could see poodling a Bradford pear. <laughs> <laughs> the proper way to prune those not- is like right at the base, <laughs> yeah, right, right, at the base. right real low. Yeah, that's the same thing. But I think I I can't imagine why you would want to ruin the form of a um, of a Japanese maple because it's so beautiful. Oh, I couldn't agree more. We're going to coin this term the maple massacre. I've seen them, you know, <laughs> in the Battery in Charleston at some just beautiful homes, and you just see these massacre trees that have been turned into these weird well, poodle again, shapes. I, but I think the reason people do that is the same reason that they murder, crate murder, crate uh, murder. It's because a lot of times they plant something in a spot that they don't leave the tree any room to grow. Exactly. So when it kind of outgrows the spot that they planted it in, they just prune the heck out of it. Um, you know, and if they would have just planted one that didn't get too big, <laughs> it's the same thing with great myrtles. People always plant them, you know, right up against the house and they never ask how big they are. And that's the prime reason we have great murders. Because they're just too big, they could have gotten a smaller one. So I've got another random question here for you. Okay, uh, you've spent a lifetime in gardening. Uh, you, you mentioned a few of your other passions, but if not gardening, what what, what do you think you'd be pursuing? Uh, well, I think I would have been a good lawyer if I had gone into that. <laughs> Plenty of grumpy I, uh, lawyers out there. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of people I'd want to get even with, you know, but <laughs> I think it, you know, yeah, so I, I think I'd have been a good lawyer. Um, I'd hire you. Um, you don't want a happy lawyer. You want a lawyer that's grumpy. Yeah, you want somebody who's, uh, you know, who can exact vengeance. So <laughs> I think I'd have been a good lawyer. Uh, I actually only took a few law classes when I was in college. I was really good at it, but anyway, um lucky for all the people in the world who I'm angry at now. Uh, I didn't pursue that. Um, I think, uh, well, I I think I would have made a really good brewer. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I I could be, you know, I could run a distillery or something like that. Maybe, I don't know. I don't think I could have been a politician because I tell the truth. (laughs) Yeah, I've heard you say that the reason you're the grumpy gardener is because you're too honest. That's right. When people 
lot of times people ask me a question. They want me to give them a certain answer. Right. They have an answer that they, you know, they want me to tell them that something stupid they did was brilliant. Right. They um, lead you in with I that. Just, yeah. I, I, the best I can come back with is you have to come, you have to have to be vague. You look at that and they're so proud of it and you go, wow, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> Who would have thought of that? That's really something, <laughs> you know? And it sounds like a compliment, but uh, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you mentioned that lawyers would be something that you would like to do because you're exacting vengeance. What about exterminator? I hear you have a burning hatred for squirrels. Oh yes, uh, we cooked one just for me. Yeah, I hate squirrels. Um, mm, there's nothing. I don't find anything good about them. Uh, I know they're part of nature, but uh, we have. Um, my backyard is primarily wood. Um, where I've got some Japanese maples growing under the high shade of oaks and stuff. And um, squirrels, well, not only do they get me and rob your bird feeder, I think I solved that problem, but um, they like to get in your attic and at least a week in the attic. Um, so uh, I have, you know, I can't stand that, so. Uh, uh, I trap them, and I take them away to a different location. <laughs> so I'll ask you, you another can... question with, uh, or if you want to expand on the squirrels there, I, I do love your hatred for squirrels. <laughs> I think, I think every question. gardener hates squirrels. If it's not, if it's yeah, not for I them think... eating their seeds that they've planted, it's for them planting walnuts all over the country into their pots well, and, Plus, they also go and they dig up, you know, anything you plant in the springtime and they have loose soil, they dig, they dig up whatever you planted and leave it to die on top of the ground. Um, hey, we have know, no love have for tree trees, rats. If you have fruit trees, they, they take all the, they bite on, you know, take off, rob all the fruit like an apple, take one little bite and throw it on the ground so it can rot. So there's nothing good about squirrels except um, if you're into the other white meat. Uh, <laughs> hey, we're from the mountains here. I believe we've. I believe there's probably a couple generations. Of Nichols grew up eating squirrel here in the mountains. Yeah, they put in some potatoes and some carrots in there. Maybe some onions. You know, I mean, you know, do a casserole. Who knows? So uh, they're local and they're sustainable. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Sounds better than bugs to me, honestly. Uh, what gardening <laughs> myths do you find the most annoying? So, like, what what things are prevalent in gardening? And, you know, it's just kind of like those wives' tales you hear passed around where people have these things that they hold dear and true to. You know, Grandma told me about this when gardening, but they're completely false or maybe just annoying to you. Do, is there any myths out there you want to dispel? Well, um, yeah, uh, I don't know. There's a couple that just go around uh, – now that you'll see go around social media and everything. The first one is this idea that the only good plants are native plants. That one just drives me crazy. It must drive you crazy because, I mean, Japanese maple. Yeah, I would uh, actually have that as a follow-up can, question for you. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you, I could take a Japanese maple, plant it in my yard, and I could take uh, a native eastern red bud, plant it in my yard. Mm -hmm. At the end of 10 years, I wouldn't probably have a single seedling from Japanese maple. At the end of 10 years, I would have 10,000 right. uh, red bud seedlings. And I had a red bud that was growing on the edge of my woods for 10 years. I decided to cut it down because it was just seeding too much. I ripped out probably 1,000 seedlings out of my woods every mm -hmm. year. And the plants were gone to me. So I always tell people, it's not necessarily where the plant comes from, but what it does when it gets here. Yeah. So that's a great point. If I think it's the right plant for the right spot. If it's native and it's great, I have a lot of native plants, but I also have camellias. Yeah. I've never had a camellia season. Um, it, it doesn't cause any problems. What does the camellia do for you? Well, in the wintertime when it blooms, it's the only nectar source for several weeks to a month for the bees, especially the native bees. Um, so 
just because it's native doesn't make it good, and just because it's uh, non-native doesn't make it bad. Yeah, I, I agree right. so much on that. I mean, we we tried to, started carrying a lot of native azaleas this year, but the reason we started carrying the native azaleas wasn't because they were native. It was because they added such a neat ornamental appeal and then what they did in the landscape, and they just complemented the maple so well that they worked so well for what we do. And it had nothing to do about them actually being native, but the fact that they're native is added benefit, but... I love native plants as long as they're cool. So if it's cool and it's got something interesting going on, you know, I'm all about yeah. it. Yeah. But I do kind of like to poke at some of the native only people a little bit and stir the pot. I had a person say, you know, what do you care? It's native. And I said, well, here's some fossil records in Henderson County of ginkgo trees. Yeah. And so right. I don't know what time frame you well, want to go to, but. Yeah. I mean, it's like, how do you know it started out here? Right. You know, and when you say native, what do you mean by native? You mean it's native. Uh, to your county, to your state, to your region, to your country. Just because something is native to North Carolina and you can say, well, it's native to the United States, doesn't mean it's going to grow in California. Right. So, and to what time frame, uh, too? Yeah. I so, I mean, that that whole thing just really, um, that it just really irritates me. I, I think, um, uh, you know, I have the same, I have the same response to people who are just going ape over GMOs. Yeah. Uh, without really realizing what a GMO is, how it's done, and uh, just because it's different and new doesn't make it a mortal threat to humanity. Right. Um, One of my favorite know, responses to people that say, I only grow native plants is, uh, what do you like to eat? <laughs> They're yeah, suddenly confronted with this, uh, okay, well, I eat a lot of non-native plants. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 uh, I did a talk about that. And I said, let's just look at what makes up our food in the United States. How many of these things do you think are native? And I started naming off the grains. I started naming off the, the fruits. You know, I started um, naming the, uh, the animals, mm -hmm. you know, cattle, pig, you know, and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. It was hard to find anything other than blueberries, pawpaws, <laughs> right. and uh, maybe some maybe some nut trees. Right. Um that are actually native here. All of our grains, the corn and I mean the wheat and uh, barley and soybeans and everything that we get in the grocery store, none of it's native to the United States. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So, now, I love native plants as long as they're cool, though. So, I mean, it's something like we carry a variegated witch hazel that's a North American native here to our region, and it's variegated yeah. and flowering, and it's as showy as any you know, ornamental Asian plant you can find. And if it brings that mm -hmm. kind of interest, I'm all about it. Yeah. Like little, yeah. little prospect that Matt's talking about flowers in in the fall. It's a Hamamalis virginiana. I mean, it okay. is a, spe I got it. it's a, it's a spectacular little small growing witch hazel mm -hmm. with amazing variegation. But for most it's people, it's just a cool witch hazel though. It's not a, it's a native R <laughs> for another bad term. Oh my. Oh no. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if they've got a lot to add to the landscape, I'm all about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So, let me see. Um, what else do you guys want to know? <laughs> well, we got, we've, we posted on our live chat. We have a video every single morning on our YouTube page. And on our live chat this morning, we, Commented in that we ha were having you for an interview this morning. And one of the uh, questions we got from Andy was, do you have any advice for growing plants in red clay in the South? Yes. And number one, it's possible. So that's another thing. We talk about old wives tell if you live in the South, we got red clay, nothing will grow there. Well, really go out your front door, take a look around. You see any trees? You right. think all those oak, oak trees and hickories and all those gum trees and everything, you think that somebody dug a big hole, amended the soil, mulched them, fertilized them, all that stuff. Um, no. Uh, and also, when you talk about NIST, you know, we come to, we come to fertilizer. Um, really, people think you got to fertilize everything. Like, how often do I fertilize my grape myrtle? Right. How much do I fertilize my maple tree? I mean, these trees, basically, if you just get them going, they know how to grow. They don't need fertilizer every year. They don't, wouldn't get it in the wild. 
Um, so now let me see. I've uh, as far as clay soil goes. If you live in the southeast where we get lots of rainfall, or even you know farther up north, even if you get into mid Atlantic, you got a lot of you got a lot of heavy clay. Um, but trees will grow in it. The trick is when you plant the tree is just to basically loosen up the soil around it. And so it gives it roots a chance to get started growing and expand beyond the hole that you mm-hmm. dug out into the soil. Um, when I was growing up, we were always telling people, oh, well, you've got to put this special soil mix in the hole. You know, you take and you dig this big hole, take out all the clay, throw that into your neighbor's yard, and then you come back and you, <laughs> you plant your you know, your tree in peat moss. But what you're doing is basically planting it inside this ceramic bowl. The roots will never go out from the good soil to the bad. You know, it's just like trying to get a teenager to go outside <laughs> on a hot day <laughs> when they could sit in the air conditioning, you know, and uh, study their phone. So the roots are just going to stay in that one little spot and the tree is just not going to grow. What I do if I have, well, I, this is what I do is uh, I dig a big hole um, I dig it about three times as wide as the root ball. Uh, loosen up all that soil. I uh, don't dig any deeper. So you want the root ball to be right around the uh, uh, soil surface or just a little bit higher. And then I backfill it with all the loose soil I just dug out. Yeah. And um, so that there's there's no difference between, because if you want a tree to get big, it's root can't just stay in a little hole that you dug and you can't amend the whole soil of your yard so uh this is the easy way to do it and then just mulch over the top i would say um but you don't have to go and and add all this peat moss and all this other stuff to clay in order to get trees to grow hey i couldn't agree more i find that the more people tell you you need to buy all of their different mixes and fertilizers they, they have those things also for sale. <laughs> so, yeah, well, I couldn't agree with you more. When I was in the nursery <laughs> business, that's what we were told to do. If you sell a tree, you have to sell them a bale of peat moss. Then you have to sell them, a, you know, a bale of a soil conditioner. Then you got to sell them, you know, uh, mulch to go on top of it. And then you need some uh, tree spike fertilizers and all those other kind of stuff. Well, yeah, that's great for the sales, but all of it um, is probably unnecessary and could be detrimental. Hey, I couldn't agree more. I really appreciate your honesty there. And it's, uh, I love your answer because I, I, I right in line with it. And it's something we tell people. So I love to hear you say it because, Hey, they'll believe you. Yeah. So, uh, another question I have for you here. Uh, I love, you know, I've, I've done some research on you. I've been friends with you for a while. I, I follow you on your, uh, YouTube and I've, I've seen where you've said that if you were going to plant a tree, you know, one, two, three, and four would be a Japanese maple. Couldn't agree more there. I'm, I'm with you. Uh, what would be your favorite companion plant for a Japanese maple? Do you have a plant you like to see around Japanese maples? What do you like to see paired with them? We talk a lot about pairings here at our nursery, and uh, oftentimes we're pairing a Japanese maple with a Japanese maple, so it's back to that one, two, three, and four. But are there plants that you like to see in accompaniment to Japanese maples? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think what you have to do is um, – kind of like look for something with a complementary foliage color or a complementary um, uh, texture, something that if, um, you know, if a Japanese maple has basically has like a horizontal branching and you want to have something that goes maybe a little more upright, maybe you want to combine it with a, uh, with an ornamental grass or something. Um, I mean, I've got them, um, uh, planted in the wood in my in the back uh where they get light shade i can grow hostas at the foot of a japanese maple mm-hmm. and uh the hostas will give me that nice foliage color underneath me you can also do it with the same thing with ferns you can put them if you've got if you're in, if you're in the shade um uh they look really cool with uh the different colors of uh carex the sedge um for instance, you can use um, the Avarillo Carex, which is uh, is bright yellow and it's mm-hmm. evergreen where I live. And you can you can pair that. You can use either a yellow or a, a deep red 
uh, Japanese maple and do stuff like that. Um, there's so many different things. I mean, I think Japanese maple, if you're in a place where you can grow conifers, I think mm-hmm. conifers and Japanese maples are just absolutely fabulous together, yeah. especially when you get some of the conifers that have the bluish foliage. Um, that is a dynamite uh, combination. Yeah, I, I love when you start pairing those in, and especially if you bring in those yellow Japanese maples. I mean, you bring those yellow yeah. Japanese maples to co- start contrasting with some of those blues and the greens. I, I always love the yellow Japanese maples, and people who watch our videos know I always talk about it. But like it, they they it's make like the Mr. Maple drinking game now. If you if you drink every time <laughs> Tim talks about yellow Japanese maples, you're you're out. <laughs> yeah, well, I've got a couple of them. You know, you guys send me that summer gold, mm-hmm. and um, it really is a good. I love that tree. I mean, it, it really does have uh, that nice uh, yellow color all summer long. So I'm a big fan of that one. Excellent. Um, We're gonna have to send you one of our you know, hot blondes. <laughs> we, it's one of our introductions from our Area 51 collection, and uh, yeah, I already got a hot blonde though. Uh, but uh, I'm <laughs> that's where I got extra credit naming it. But we'll have to send you one of these. It's an Acer Olivier MX, so a Chinese maple, a little bit more heat tolerant. But I'd love to know yeah. what you thought about that one. We'll have to get you one of those. We'll have to send a thank oh, you letter with it, that. That reminds me, I got another one that I really like. I just want to plug this one because I think it's really cool. Um, it's the um, uh, Hubs Red Willow. Oh, yeah, great plant. I've seen that your pictures one, of that one. Yeah, I mean, it, it's like I've got, and then I actually, I, I took a picture and I did it for my grumpy Facebook page. It's got beautiful color in the in the fall and nice color other times of the year, and there's long stringy leaves, and it's just really cool looking. Hey, while yeah. we mention that, I'll go ahead and throw out there. What's the best way for people to find you? Is it through your Facebook page, or what's the best way for people? If they're listening to this, they already know about you, but what's the best way for them to find you? I would say the easiest thing is just go on um, go on Facebook. And then just uh, and then do a search for Grumpy Gardener, and you'll find me. Hey, I've There's been really enjoying your uh, your uh, YouTube's. Uh, you know, mostly through Southern Living, where you've got all kinds of YouTube. I've probably annoyed my wife to death while she's asleep at night listening to you <laughs> on our TV through YouTube. Uh, I love your blunt answers. Uh, you know, to <laughs> questions on those. I kind of <laughs> like how some of your videos lead in. It reminds me of Deep Thoughts by Jack Handy. Uh, it's the old <laughs> SNL skit. It's like. And now, yeah. Grumpy Gardener. It reminds me a lot of that. But I love from your old Christmas videos to your, um, gosh, mosquito videos. So many of those are just kind of deadpan, and I find them hilarious. I did find an impersonator, Grumpy Gardener, on YouTube. How do you feel about that guy, and what other names should he change to? He's not even funny at all, by the way. Okay. Um, uh, maybe, I don't know. Maybe um, he could, uh, I don't know, just. Well, I had some suggestions. Like maybe he could pick a different of the seven dwarfs. Like he could go by like Sleepy yeah. Gardener or Bashful. Dopey. Or Dopey. Yeah. <laughs> dopey, yeah, the Dopey Gardener. You know, actually, there are a couple other Grumpy Gardeners out there. There's one guy, uh, I think he's got about four followers um, on there. And then there is a Grumpy Gardener company in England that sells all sorts of gardening equipment. And ah, I think that's the one I saw. He, People confuse me, and they think that we are connected. And they're not um, funny at all, either. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, my grumpy gardener that I do on Facebook, I answer lots of people's questions about anything gardening from all over the country, and uh, I don't charge anything, and I don't, I don't, I don't uh, sell merchandise on the page or anything like that. Another thing that you can find me is uh, I am now on TikTok. Uh oh. So if people are, are on, yeah. So if the uh, if the younger crowd, and of course, when you talk to, to me, younger crowd is anybody you know below the age of uh, fifty five. Um, you just go and you do a search for Grumpy Gardener on uh, TikTok, and you'll see some of my uh, videos there. Hey, I, I've not got on TikTok yet, but I may be forced to to listen to some of Grumpy Gardener's hot takes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I heard yeah. I heard that Gene B- uh, Bassell was accredited uh, online somewhere that for giving you the Grumpy Gardener moniker originally. Is that true? Is there a story behind that? Yeah, uh, uh, Gene Bissell used to be um, uh, a garden editor at uh, Southern Living. We worked together um, for uh, oh gosh, quite a number of years. 
And when they were trying to think of a page, a uh, special page that we could have fun with in the magazine, and we had to figure out what we were going to call it, and I was going to write it, and it was all going to be first person. He came up with The Grumpy Gardener. So I really, uh, he that was coined by him, and everybody immediately said, yeah, that's right, because it just suits me so perfectly. And I have to admit, uh, my wife would tell you the same thing, that if he hadn't come up with a name, she would have. Right. <laughs> He he was actually we were down at uh Coach Pat Dyes down at his hunting lodge. And Gene was actually the reason we got into Southern Living Magazine as being recommended on an article once. I think it was back in two thousand ten, maybe. It was pretty yeah, early on. It maybe two thousand eleven. And he oh, yeah. he he literally uh put in there Mr. Maple dot com and we were known as Nichols Nursery and it said Nichols Nursery, right. Mr. Maple dot com. And once we were in Southern Living Magazine, like just as a rec- small recommendation F- under the name Mr. Maple, we, that was it. We that no was, longer that went was by it. Nichols Nursery. Again. We we went and changed the actual name of the business from Nichols Nursery, which was what our dad had started, to Mr. Maple. So Gene is partly resp- uh, responsible too for us as Mr. Maple. Yeah, he must have met you when he was doing that story down in South, in the South Alabama, yeah, South yeah. Georgia, something like that. Yeah, he was yeah, visiting our friend Bill that. Shell. Yeah, and he was telling me about all these fantastic Japanese maples that this guy had. And they were all, you know, big, nice, big, kind of mature trees. He went, yeah, I remember that story. Nice. So that's where Mr. Maple came from. Boy, he should have sold all the names that he came up with. <laughs> so it's already 11 o'clock there. Uh, are you two or three in yet? <laughs> yeah, it's already past my morning gear time. Um, usually... Uh, it's kind of like, you know, mid morning, you know, and, uh, um, time to, you know, look back on the, you know, the day behind me and plan out everything for the rest of the uh, morning. <laughs> hey, I love your <laughs> honesty in these videos from, you know, you're just your hot takes. Uh, I, I love all your honesty you give people in there. I got a good, another idea. I had the, uh, horticulture hoarder show. I think we can have curb your gardening enthusiasm. And we can have Steve <laughs> with some micro brews and it's just a call in show and you just shut people's ideas down like right away with like real good blunt answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do like the micro brews. I'm a home brewer, so um I've got some stuff. I've got some um oh it's uh I've got some ale that's been uh it actually fermented in my basement for a year. It was so high gravity. And um but it's really, really good. It's uh, it's a Scotch ale. Um, it's a, like a double Scotch ale, but you can only drink one. <laughs> we, I've uh, speaking of shutting down people's answers. I heard that someone once asked you that their plant was, you know, not leafing out this year. Will it leaf out the following year? Like, yeah, <laughs> we plants <laughs> often skip a year of life, just like people. We we get the craziest <laughs> questions too. I mean, I, I told our our office manager Jody that she would she would it would be her spirit animal. She gets some fun questions from time to time, and I said well, Steve I, gives them the answers that you wish you could give them. Sometimes, See, Steve, we literally got someone who called us once who said we were at a garden show down in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, selling Japanese maples, and we sold someone a Japanese maple. And sometimes people just walk up and hand you money and say, "I want this," and he bought this cultivar called Hogoku. And he called oh, up, yeah. he called up and he said, he was in tears, he was in tears crying. And we thought it was someone pranking us. And he's like, guys, guys, this, this tree is turning orange. It's just, neon it, it, orange. I think it's about to die. I think it's about to die. And, uh, you know, I, I had barely had the heart to say it's going to turn orange every year, right before it drops leaf. So that was another mic drop right there. But, and he's like, it's going to yeah, drop yeah. leaf. What? So we, we, we do get a little bit of that too. I get, I get your, your blunt honesty side of things. We, we definitely take that approach too. And, uh, you know, by the end of that conversation, he said, you know, it kind of is pretty, this fall color on this Hogoku. I think I could learn to look forward to this every year. Yeah. You know, I just got a question that somebody sent to me on my grumpy page and it was, um, uh, why did my loquat die? (laughs) 
That's all they said. <laughs> Their name and why did my low squat die? <laughs> That's a great question, right? My, I'm going to say it had something to do with attention answer, to detail. <laughs> yeah, my my uh, my answer was absent any other information, I'd say the cause is death. <laughs> oh man. Uh, Steve, we really appreciate you being on here, man. It's it's so much fun. Uh, you're you're a personal hero of ours. Uh, I actually first met you. I was speaking at the statewide Master Gardener Conference in Columbia, South Carolina. It was about oh, 350 yeah. people. I think you were the keynote speaker. I don't even know how I got on the docket. It was one of the biggest things I ever did at the time. And uh, you were a speaker there. And the first interaction I had with you is we went out to dinner. And somebody gave you a beer called Arrogant Bastard, and you turned it toward me and said, I'm drinking it because I am. (laughs) And I said, I like this guy. He's funny. And uh, I I enjoyed your talk. It was one of the best and funniest garden talks I've ever seen to date. And, uh, hey, your humor is inspiring. We love it. And, uh, you know, when you're being grumpy, it definitely makes people happy. (laughs) Well, thanks a lot. I've enjoyed talking to both of you guys. Hey, thanks so much for joining in today on the Mr. Maple Show. Uh, We'll put this out on all major podcast platforms. And just a huge thank you from us to Steve Bender, the Grumpy Gardener, for being on here. Sir, it's an honor. Yeah, Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, we we really had such a blast talking to you this morning. I could actually probably see us having future conversations in the future just because you're such a fun person to talk to about gardening. And uh, we really appreciate coming in today. Before you guys go, you, you brought up Eric and Bastard, so I got to tell you this funny story. Okay. Because it is one of my favorite beers. Uh, but I, my son, now lives up in um, Virginia, um, he's into uh, home brewing with me too. Um, and so he was coming home for uh, Christmas. And so we had to think about what we were going to give each other for Christmas presents. So reached under uh, the Christmas tree and I pulled one out for him. And he pulled one out for me. <laughs> and when I opened it up, it was an arrogant bastard funny. T-shirt. Right? And it said, I'm not, you're not worthy. It said, arrogant bastard. <laughs> so he opened his up, and I had given him an arrogant bastard T-shirt. Oh, that's hilarious. So he both <laughs> took a picture of us wearing our arrogant bastard with that, you know, kind of haughty look. Like, they're not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. So today's podcast not sponsored by Arrogant Bastard Beard, but if they would like to, <laughs> to throw us a couple T-shirts or something, hey, go right ahead. Uh, again, uh, why don't you make a, uh, one more, let people know where they can find you. Uh, I'm sure if they're listening to this, they have already found you. You're legendary. So uh, what's the best way people can find Steve Bender and interact with you and support what you're doing? Uh, maybe buy some of your books, some of the great work you put out there also. Okay, three ways. Number one, uh, if you go to my Grumpy Gardener Facebook page, just search for Grumpy Gardener on Facebook. Mm-hmm. I'm there every single day of the year. Um, my uh, Grumpy Gardener uh, column in uh, Fun Living Magazine is in there uh, every month. The most popular part of the magazine, I may think so. <laughs> and um, I'm also doing the TikTok videos. So, uh, and you can also find me, uh, my articles on, uh, southernliving.com, our, uh, website. Sir, it's, it's a complete honor to have you on our show. We're humbled and honored. Uh, King Grumpy here himself. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, hey, my pleasure. Love doing it. All right. Take care. Have a good one. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That went great. Uh, you know, special thanks to Steve Bender of, Grumpy Gardener and Southern Living Magazine. Uh, We're just humbled and honored to have you on our show. Guys, we plan on doing more and more content like this, so if you're a fan of these gardening interviews, let us know in the comment section below some other gardening celebrities you'd love to see us uh, basically do this sit-down talk with here on our garden show. We love to have a conversation with people, people who are passionate about Japanese maples and gardening, and, uh, you know, if their favorite plant is Japanese maples, we got to have them on. Japanese maples are what we're passionate about. And being able to talk to other people who love Japanese maples, love gardening, it's just an exciting time for us. Steve Bender, the grumpy gardener. I mean, I don't think that could have went much better. Hey, I'm cool now. Like I said, I have several family members who don't know a single, they couldn't name you a single plant I grow. But as soon as I said I was going to get to interview Steve Bender, they were like, I know the grumpy gardener. 
Wow, that's a big deal. So, you know, special thanks to him. We're just humbled that he would uh, consider doing this. And uh, you can sign up for these podcasts on all major platforms. So you can watch these on YouTube. They premiere uh, on Sunday nights on YouTube. Uh, we'll be doing a live chat there with folks So these premieres. So if you want the video form, they're there. But also don't forget to go and subscribe on all major podcast platforms. I know on Spotify and Pandora, if you go in there and sub us and give us a five-star rating, that goes a long way toward promoting it for other people. And one thing you can do too, if you love listening to these podcasts, we release these podcasts early on the platforms before the YouTube videos come out. Mm -hmm. So you can actually go and listen to that ahead of time before and get involved with the live chat and know some of the stuff that's coming up. Oh, so yeah. just, just a tip there. You know, if you've got Amazon Music, if you've got Alexa, you can literally say, Alexa, play the Mr. Maple Show and Mr. Maple Show podcast, and it will pull up and start playing. So we're super excited about this podcast and where this can go uh, with Mr. Maple and talking about Jappy's Maples, bringing you a unique gardening content mm -hmm. here on the Mr. Maple Show podcast. It's, it's something we've always dreamed about doing and having it come to fruition here is super exciting to share that passion with you guys. Special thanks to Brian Rule and Sean Richardson. Sean's the one playing that amazing guitar intro and outro you guys are hearing. We love that. Greatly appreciate you tuning in today, guys. Take care. God bless. And have a great day.